podcast. This is episode one. We have a very, very special guest today. I'm super excited to introduce. We have Meta Sandiford Artest. That's what you're going by right now. Well, you know, um, that's my real name. Okay. I changed my name to my wife's last name. Okay. It used to be Ron Artest, and then I went to Meta World Peace. Then when I got married, um, I took Artest back, and then Sandiford is her last name. Oh, okay. So it's Meta Sandiford Artest. Okay, what made you change your name to Meta? Well, initially, it was, I got into Buddhism. Okay. You know, um, just being from uh, where we're from, you know, being the, from the urban community, and you don't really get access to different, you know, uh, faiths or beliefs, you know, and different things like that. So, I mean, I grew up Baptist. Okay. Um, I also went to a Catholic high school. Oh, okay. I went to a Catholic university. You know, um, my grandma was Jehovah's Witness. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I also went to a... Um, I went to, uh, I think, like a Mormon church also a couple times oh, wow. when okay. I was young with some friends. But then as I got older, I discovered uh, Buddhism. And then it took me about maybe five to seven years to really, uh, you know, adjust to it, adapt to it. And then, you know, you know, Meta is a Buddhist name. Right. And it means loving kindness, right? It means like the ultimate level of friendship, loving, ultimate friend, ultimate uh, level of kindness, you know, just being... It was kind of opposite on, like, um, how I grew up. Okay. You know, we grew up kind of in the jungle, so it's all about survival, mm. right? And it's all about, you know, um, just being ready <laughs> whenever you got to be ready. Right. Right. And and that was something that I just wanted to kind of get away from. Mm-hmm. So, you know, then it's, like, total opposite, like, kind of a, how I grew up. Right. And then as far as Buddhism, like, how did you, you know, discover Buddhism? How did that impact your life? Yeah, you know, it initially happened because uh, basketball was like the center of my life mm-hmm. for a long time. Uh, my dad introduced it to me. I was about eight years old. Okay. Um, I was getting in a lot of trouble as a kid. So my dad was trying to find something for me to do. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, and what was the beginning of your question? It's just like what... You know, how did you find it, and how did that impact your life? My Buddhism? Yeah. All right, so, yeah, I guess that's it, that's it. So, then I was trying to give you more, more of the story, but what happened was, when I was playing basketball, I wasn't, I was always a really good player. Mm-hmm. You know, I was McDonald's All-American. Right. I was, all that stuff, you know, um, but I could have been better if it wasn't for, you know, uh, kind of my personality and my character. That's pretty much from where I'm from, <laughs> Queensbridge, you know? Right. I, it was uncontrollable, so I still got, like, a ton of awards and stuff in the NBA, but I felt I could have had more if I had more control over my game. Okay. Over, over my, uh, you know, passion. Right. So with that being said, when I started to do sports therapy, mm-hmm. um, and my, one of my therapists was teaching me how to breathe. Okay. And when she, when she introduced that, I was like, oh, that's pretty dope. <laughs> you know, I was like, mm, of course it's like, I was like, that's a, that's pretty. Um, I was like, that's pretty dope, mm-hmm. you know. And um, when she introduced me to breathing, I started to study it more and more and more, apply it to my therapy sessions, and then I'm like, oh, I, I, I'm looking up more. Uh, you know, uh, what is breathing? Where does it come from? Where right. does this whole concept come from? And then I said that led me to Buddhism. Right. And then um, how did you apply that to like your games? Like game day, did you meditate? Like how did you know? That's a good question. It took a long time. Mm. You know, it's, it's like anything. Anything great takes a long time. Right. You know, um, so it didn't happen overnight. Mm. But I did discover, um, i say I started to implement breathing about 27. Okay. Maybe 26. Okay. And then I realized, then I started to play better. Mm. You know, I, always, I was a kid that always had a lot of heart. So, you know, big game on the line, I'm taking the shot. Mm. Right. But I didn't make it a lot, but I would always take it. Okay. Right? Yeah. Now, with that being said, how do I start making these shots? And this is just sports. Mm-hmm. So I started to just focus on being in the moment versus worrying about what happened yesterday, what's going to happen tomorrow, all this other stuff. Right. And that's where breathing and that type of stuff takes an effect. So I started to apply that in the game. Mm-hmm. And then my therapist taught me, like, how do you control anxiety on the basketball court or on the field when you're playing sports. Right. Right? So you can't just stop a game and start meditating at half court. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> so one of the things we talked about was in-game meditation. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's breathing at the same pace, which is probably like more like... 
Right. And that took about three seconds. Mm -hmm. That same pace throughout the game. Okay. No matter what happens, no matter how fast you're running, no matter if you're playing post defense, no matter if you're going up for an one. Right. That same pace uh, of, of breath, and then that kind of helped me stay in the moment mm -hmm. and go yeah. from moment to moment. Yeah. Yeah. And then as far as you know, um, seeking out therapy. What point in your career did you do that? Like. Well, it was introduced early, okay. you know, when I, um, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know, my, my family was uh, introduced to therapy and psychology and psychiatry both uh, for a long time. Okay. Uh, since I was, before I was born. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm saying? So with that being said, you know, I was introduced to it at 13 years old where I went to my first social worker session with a bunch of kids in our neighborhood from Queensbridge. Mm, okay. And, um... And those sessions was it was kind of awkward because it's like just you know I don't know you're from Compton or wherever you're from and imagine going to one building is a therapy session you know sometimes people will tend to make fun of you because you're going into right. that building they know what that building is they know what that door is you know but my mom just told me just go you know you need to be find a way to cope you know and deal with your anger mm -hmm. as a child so then at 13 years old <clears throat> I got suspended in school since I got suspended in preschool. Three years old. Preschool? Yeah, preschool. Okay. Every year in preschool, every year in kindergarten, well, in kindergarten, mm. then every year in elementary school, one through six, then every year in uh, middle school, okay. my first year in high school. Wow. And then I didn't get suspended again until college. Oh, wow. And then an MBA. I got suspended probably for every year in MBA also. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. But, um, and you know, but luckily I had that as a 13 year old, you know, how do you, if I didn't have that, I don't know what I would have been doing right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to commend you for like, you know, seeking out therapy. I feel like as a man, there's a lot of negative stigma around it. But I mean, that's dope that you were able to like realize that you needed to seek that out. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like, you know, you said that you grew up in Queens Queensbridge, right? Mm -hmm. In the projects. You said you grew up around like, you know, dope dealing and everything like that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, How did you, you know, like what daily practices did you have? Like that set you apart from your peers, you know what I'm saying? Like, cause it's easy to get caught up in the environment mm -hmm. that you grew up in. So like, how did you make it out basically? Well, I'm not gonna say make it out um, mm -hmm. cause mentally I'm still there. Okay. You know, all my friends are still there. Mm -hmm. um, I go back home and you know, it's it's just regular old Ron is back. Right. Right. Um, but cause it's hard. One person make it out, but at the same time, you still have well, it's the biggest federal housing projects in America, mm -hmm. but um, you still have thousands and thousands of people that's still there. Right. So, you know, my, my mindset was, I just, my whole thing, I just didn't want to go to jail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. I guess that was my whole thing, just not going to jail. You know, all my friends going to jail, all this other stuff. You know, so one of the things I would do was, um, I would focus on like math, actually, a lot. Okay. So I'll be in the neighborhood, we play basketball, everybody's outside, you're smoking weed, or you're selling dope, or whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and just, I always had to keep my mind focused on something else. Mm -hmm. So as I got older and getting closer and closer to college and MBA, mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I for sure can't, I gotta stay out of trouble because I was already dibbling and dabbling mm -hmm. in, the, in the streets a little bit. Mm -hmm. So how can I stay focused? So I would just buy like math workbooks, you know, and just be on the block. <laughs> And right. just doing math. Okay. And then I then it helped me. Um, then my first major was architecture okay. in college, and I was going to major in math. So it's just finding things, you know, that you can focus on, you know, because, you know, in, 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 these, in, these, in, these, in these environments, it's kind of hard, you know, uh, to focus. So that's why I'm not going to say I made it out because I got lucky. Mm. You know, right. my dad took me to the court. Some of my friends didn't have dads. Some of my friends were so dope to their moms, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, uh, you know, it's just, I just got lucky that my dad, even though he's left us, but he came to see me every day. Mm. If he didn't, I don't know what would have happened. Right. Yeah. You know? And then as far as like, you know, finding your passion and realizing it was basketball, you know, I know you, you did blue and dabble in music, right? Yeah. I watched, yeah, yeah. I watched, what's that? Okay. I watched one of your videos. I feel like it was, um, <laughs> I only got a few people yeah. representing. Yeah, represent. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, I watched it. And it was actually good. You're good. Representing is okay. It's a it's a solid track for me. Yeah. Yeah. I like music. You know, obviously, I mean, I'm from Queensbridge, for mm -hmm. one. Like, you talk about Queensbridge, you know, it's not one area in America that has as many stars from one hood. Mm -hmm. You know, you got MC Shan. You know, then you got uh, Marley Ma, who produced tracks for 
uh, Karis One and all these mm-hmm. amazing producers and and uh, and Big Daddy Kane and he produced tracks for I don't even know who else. Eric B and Rakim, you're probably too young for that. Then, <laughs> <laughs> you're probably too young for that. Love it, love it. <laughs> but then you got uh, Roxanne Shante. Okay. Uh, she has a, a story on Netflix right now. Yeah, she was big back in the days. Then you got Nas, and you have Mob Deep, and Capone Noriega, and Nature, and Carmega, and and, and, and it's just it's more. Right. <laughs> it's um. So with that being said, um, uh, then all these stories that people hear that push culture, mm-hmm. you know, in the nineties, <laughs> I was in it. That's where I was at in the nineties, right? right? So, you know, then you know from that perspective. We just, everybody's rapping. And you, you only hear about the rappers in Queensbridge that you hear about. Mm. You don't hear about the other hundred that are rapping. Right. You know, which a lot of them was my friends. So, you know, we just love music. But I was more focused on honestly being one of the best defensive players ever and then trying to get my offensive game up. But I still had this chip on my shoulder. Um, and that's why, you know, I was trying to figure out an outlet. Right. And then music was that, you know, you go to the studio and you just like, you know, rap over a beat, let mm-hmm. out some feelings, let out some emotion. Uh, and that's kind of what it was for me. Um, I did want to focus 100% of my time on it. I just never had the opportunity to focus 100% on music, you know, um, yeah. and really develop as an artist. But I really enjoyed it. It was it was fun. Okay, and you tapped into boxing as well too, right? Yeah, my dad was a boxer. Right. You know, my dad was a boxer. And... Um, we also have a boxing champion from Queensbridge. His name is Louis uh, Dalval. He was the first fighter to knock down Roy Jones, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, he's a, he was a champion. But um, we also had my dad was a boxer, but he wanted me to. He never wanted me to fight because mm. he used to box. He didn't want me to get hit, so he kept me on the court, kept me away from the ring. Okay. But I always wanted to box. Right. Um, so when I was twenty four. Uh, right before I got suspended in the NBA, my dad introduced me to Angelo Dundee, who was Muhammad Ali's trainer. Mm. I don't know how they met, but they did. I was on the phone with Angelo Dundee, RIP Angelo. He passed away. He was also um, Sugar Ray Leonard's trainer, another big boxer. And um, I was going to turn pro when I was 35, so I was going to train for 10 years because when I, when I, I knew I wanted to go pro as a boxer, but um, I knew it was going to take about 10 years to become a really good fighter because right. I didn't want to get into the ring not being ready mm-hmm. so and, I, and I've been watching boxing since I was eight so I understand Tyson you know he was a he started boxing at 13 okay really training oh. boxing mm-hmm. right then he became champion at 18 mm-hmm. right so when you talk about that type of preparation I, I wanted to give my dad about four fights uh, but then when the brawl happened I was going to announce that year I had an album coming out that year with Allure, an R and B group, mm-hmm. and I was going to announce I'm turning pro when I retire at 35. Oh, okay. Wow. But when the pro happened, it kind of got. I didn't want to come out and say I'm going to start fighting because I already had a big incident and I didn't want to. Um, I wanted to come. I wanted to come back to the NBA, so I just kind of left that dream. Mm-hmm. I let it go, but okay. um, I watch boxing. I love boxing. It's what it's my favorite thing to do. I much rather do boxing commentating than basketball. Okay. Commentary. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, and then you just mentioned, mentioned your incident. Um, as far as that, I I know that you said that you were like seeking out therapy throughout your career, and then the uh, Malice in the Palace incident happened. Uh-huh. Um, how did that set back not only your you know physical health but mental health? Because you were suspended for what eighty six games. Oh, um, it was yeah. The longest yeah, yeah suspension, suspension I think non yeah. drug related so that's crazy yeah 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 how did that affect your mental and physical health I mean um I was that incident I didn't let that affect me that much okay because someone you know started some it was provoked right yeah someone started it and you know we're taught to finish it <laughs> you know but from that perspective it, it bothered me from just not being on the court. Okay. That's what really bothered me because I was having a big year that year. Uh, we were the best team in the league, and uh, I was reigning defensive player of the year, third team only. All this stuff was happening, and um, then when I got suspended, that's a whole year. That's eighty six games. That's about two thousand points. 
crazy. There's a lot of things yeah. at stake that people don't really understand with legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, I played 991 games in my career. Wow. I don't have a thousand games. I don't have a, another All Star, another Defensive Player of the Year, another All NBA. You know, and it just so it's like legacy from that perspective, which that that's what I'm. That's what kicks me in the ass all the time. Right. That's what I think about. Not so much the brawl, just like the the, the stats. Right. You know, the wins. Right, right, right. You know, that type of stuff that you can't get back. Right. You know, but it's okay. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then as far as like on the topic of work ethic, going back to that, um, you know, you obviously played with Kobe Bryant, um, R. P. Kobe. But um, I just wanted you to speak to like his work ethic. How was how did he inspire his team? I know like he did like the five thirty a.m. workouts, yeah. all that. But what else, what what other habits habits did he like um, practice? Today? Well, he was. Um, I mean, I thought I was the hardest worker, and even in my documentary or in Jermaine O'Neal's documentary, Mouse with Powell, Jermaine mentions how hard I worked. Mm -hmm. That you never seen nobody work as hard. And that was something that I lived by. But when I got with Kobe, I'm like, wow, this is like a whole other level. And I was kind of upset at myself. I'm saying, I, you know, I thought I was doing everything it takes to be the hardest worker. Not necessarily the best player, just the hardest worker. Mm -hmm. And Kobe's up at 5.30, not one day, but every day. Mm -hmm. not, not up at 5.30, at the gym at 5.30. At the gym at 5.30. You know, when he's really in his mode. Right. And one day, and... I was in the gym a lot too. I was in the gym a lot, but I would like go at 9 a.m. or maybe 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. Then I would go like again at 12 p.m., then again at 2 p.m., then play at 5 p.m., you know? And yeah. my day was about seven hours, you know? But I'm like, to get there that early, you know, and you got your whole day, you know, ahead of you. But when you get there that early, you're able to get more working. Right. You know, yeah. and it shows discipline. Mm -hmm. So one day, uh, I, I wanted to see Kobe at the gym just to show him I'm working hard too. <laughs> I couldn't get up that early, but I got there around 8 a.m. He was leaving. He was in his car leaving. <laughs> Showered up, leaving. Got done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's who Kobe was. You know, mm -hmm. um, a great great guy. I miss him. Yeah. He's still here though. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, and then, as far as like a specific memory with him, do you have one that you can share? Or? I mean, my, my most fav favorite memory with Kobe is um, because me and Kobe's very similar. Mm -hmm. I tell people a lot. Like, um, we didn't even have lunch or dinner. And I, I said this multiple times, but we didn't have lunch or dinner until his last year in the league. Mm -hmm. When I got there, I wasn't thinking about going out with my friends, making friends. Right. All I wanted to do is win a title. Mm -hmm. um, and... And Kobe's the same way, you know? Right. We're not like, hey, let's get lunch. It's like, hey, good work. practice, see you later. Right. See you in the morning, the next day, bye bye. Um, talking about the game, talking about work. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one day, it was like towards the end of his career, we had dinner. I'm like, oh, yeah, I said, man, don't you realize this is like our first dinner? Like, just chilling? I was like, oh, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a hell of a moment. Oh, no. And, um, and he was, a, he's, a, he's a hell of a writer. Okay. He's a, he's a really good writer. Um, I mean, he he had an album actually, but he never put it out. Like he he did he completed oh. it, but he just shelved it for many reasons. But he's a writer, you know. Oh, dope. Okay. Um. So yeah, grew a really great writer. His he has a book called Wizard Art, the Wizard Art series, okay. which he wrote a lot of it, edited. I, maybe he had help with the writing, but I know he was involved in doing the edits and looking at it. I went to his office one day. He had like seven pals of these Wizard Art series books, and he was telling me how it works. Wow. And um, it's supposed to be like magical books. But now you see where everything is going, you know, yeah. NFTs and all this stuff going right. on, right? It's like, he's a visionary. He invested in body armor early, um, which is really good. Now, you know, he, he's, he's a visionary and he has so much more to give. Uh, yeah. Very, very smart, uh, very smart guy. Very forward thinking. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like the Lakers right now, yeah. you know, how, how do you feel about the Lakers right now? Well, I feel like it's a, I feel like people got to appreciate it because even though we're playing really bad, right? Not really bad. We can go to the playoffs. <laughs> right. But, you know, to our standards, right. it's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, you know, I just want to enjoy Melo, Russell, AD, LeBron, they all on one jersey, one team. Right. Rondo is here for a little bit. And this is, you don't really get this often. You know, um, these guys are older. It's not like they're bad. You know, it's like if these guys were 25, 
26. This would be a huge problem. Mm. There's no who, who would beat these guys, right? So I don't want to take away from who these guys are. Right. These guys are legends. So it's like we, we got to enjoy it. We know that they're playing bad, and it's not like they're going to go from here on out and win every game. They're probably going to lose some games. Right. You know, it is what it is at this point. And at this point, I'm not going to – I'm just going to enjoy it. I don't, we don't know if Melo's going to be here next year. We don't know if LeBron is going to be there. True. You know, you also yeah. got to enjoy it while it's here. Yeah. Um, and then as far as um, – I have, like, general questions. Actually. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this one is just, what's the best mistake that you've ever made? Hmm. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, the it's best. Like a, yeah, it's like a twisted Yeah, it's great. I mean, that's that, you know, failure is very important. People say that often, mm-hmm. but it's true. I think the best mistake I ever made was uh, probably not investing in um, in uh, vitamin water. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was about 26 years old, and, you know, all these deals start coming to you. So vitamin water came to me. But, but I was still, like, in basketball mode. I wasn't necessarily in, like, business mode. Mm, okay. So I didn't really understand the deal. And then three months later, it went public, and I would have made a ton of money if I would have put some cash into it. And then that kind of led me to, you know, understanding, like, business more. So then after that deal passed, uh, I think I missed on uh, Shoe Dazzle and Legal Zoom all at the same time. Oh, wow. You know, but now, that, that was about 25, 26, I'm 42 now, so, you know, I, I kind of made up for it. But with that being said, I didn't really understand how these deals were structured. Right. And I got so upset when I said, oh, my goodness, like, what just happened? Like, people made millions. My friends made made millions. And I'm just like, huh, I got to maybe stop focusing (laughs) on defense so much. (laughs) Focus on the business. But that was probably the best mistake. For sure. And then my second question is, what does success mean to you? Success, uh, it means, I think, uh, it's execution. Okay. Many reasons, because you can be, you know, 7 billion people on the planet, and we have 1% that's very wealthy. So sometimes if success is financial uh, to you, well, sometimes no matter what you do or how smart you are, you might not get the opportunity. That's true. Right? Uh, people have master degrees, mm-hmm. you know, and can't get the opportunity. Because it's just not enough room. It's like there's only so much room for so many things, so you got to always maneuver mm-hmm. and figure out how to get there. Yeah, true. So execution is success to me. Uh, the more you execute, um, and Kobe used to say this about Stephen Curry all the time, he would never leave any stones unturned. He, and he doesn't probably leave any stones unturned. So I think um, I think execution is success. Um, that's more from a business standpoint. That's you know? a great answer. Yeah. Okay, for sure. And then the last general question is, what is the best advice that you've ever received? Uh, the best advice that I ever received, that's funny, that's a good question. Huh? I have tons of advice. Um, probably just keep your family first, actually. Okay. Yeah. 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 And how did you balance that throughout your career, like making sure that you know, you're spending time with your family, obviously? Well, for me, it was really difficult. I had my first child, I was 16. Okay. And then 18, I had around 18, and then... Than 20 and 22. So, so for me, I, you know, um, I thought I, w- I knew what I was doing as a 16-year-old dad, mm. you know, getting the milk. And <laughs> I'm like, I, in my 16-year-old body, I'm a man. Right. You know, I feel like I'm going to the store, get milk, changing the diet. But I got my kid. I'm 18. I got two kids. Yeah, I'm a man. Oh, no. But if you're looking down, mm. you know, a 42-year-old was to see an 18-year-old with two kids going to the store and <laughs> How are you doing that? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't even finish college yet. So from that perspective, um, you know, I I learned a lot, mm. you know, but I was learning on the job, literally learning on the job. Okay. That's dope. And then as far as like new business ventures, I know you just had your app, you know, you recently released, which is like X versus X, right? For yeah. Things. Um, are there any like new projects that you're working on that you can speak on? Or? Yeah. Just from like an entrepreneurial perspective. Um, we have an artist management group, mm, okay. and we have a couple of different divisions, which I'm happy to be about. And it's a startup company, but we have um, a business management division. So we have a couple of boxers that are assigned to us um, right now. 
Uh, we also have basketball players okay. that signed to us, all business management, like taxes and reconciliations, and some, and some businesses too. Okay. We have businesses that are assigned to us. So we pay their bills, do their taxes, their legal, everything. And I invested in that company maybe like seven years ago. Okay. And then we have the, uh, the tech division. Mm-hmm. So it's called Edge First X Sports. So that's where we give local basketball players, team owners, opportunity to gain exposure in the community and then also gain exposure nationally. Okay. And make money playing basketball. For sure. So that's really cool. That's going really well. And then we have investments. Uh, a couple of companies I'm happy about. Um, uh, Easy Care Link is one of the companies I'm happy about. It's a healthcare company okay. that we just invested in. Um, which I'm just doing really well. Uh, Buttercloth is another company that I like that we invested in that's doing really well. Planet Based Foods just went public in Canada. So I'm happy about that company. And uh, we have another company I'm a public here in America called Charge, which I'm happy about. Wow. Um, and we might have another company. But yeah, so, you know, we have a, it's an artist management group. And not only do we manage athletes, but we also, um, we actually help manage a lot of businesses. But we also try to help launch, you know, the athletes' businesses and different things like that. Okay. Um, and I don't run it, you know, but, you know, I'm kind of, I just structured it and we have a platform you know, for athletes, um, you know, I'm really excited about. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a small business. It's not a huge business. It's small, but it's um, it's being an entrepreneur and just giving a lot of people opportunities to work. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of interns. We have, um, you know, a lot of people move on to other things. So our internship program is really good because they actually learn. So I'm really happy about it because we're able to teach an intern you know, not only, don't, I don't need you to just give me coffee. I can get my own coffee. Right. You know, I need you to actually uh, get better, you know. So yeah. the internship program is something is really, is really big to us. That's dope. Um, and then as far as, like, your career, you know, you obviously played basketball your whole life. And then your last game, like, what was the feeling during that game? Were you ready to just pursue your entrepreneurship, at, like, ventures? Or were you, like, sad about it? How did that feel? The last game, the last game was better because I wanted to do 20 years in the NBA. I did 18. Okay. Um... So my last game at Staples was amazing. I had 18 in the second half. Mm. So that was great. But then my last game, the next day we played um, at Golden State, and I didn't play a lot. I wanted to play 30 minutes. I only played like six minutes. <laughs> so, I had six <laughs> points. I had two threes. Okay. I just wanted to go out with a super bang, and I just played six minutes. I don't You I played don't six know. minutes in your last game ever? I just can't believe it. Dang. Can't believe it. That's crazy. <laughs> okay. That's okay. But you were ready to like, you know, move on to like different avenues right like um no oh, no oh, i yes. mean i was already into i was already starting business mm-hmm. at that time okay um i was already i was not ready mm-hmm. this is 2017 i was already doing business earlier i just started you know doing business but at the same time my mind wasn't fully prepared to go so the next day was really shocking but then you know, I was kind of nervous, like, oh, my goodness, like, what am I going to do? Right. You know, I'm used to preparing, getting up, running, get, getting deep, you know, getting ready to play defense or whatever the case may be. But then, um, so it was really scary. But then the next day I applied to school, kind of had, a, I had about maybe four or five hours to myself, went to get some coffee, just get out the funk. It took about four hours. I applied to uh, UCLA. Okay, wow. And then I applied to Concordia Irvine. So I did business analytics at Concordia on Saturdays. And then I did a... Uh, and uh, digital analytics at UCLA. Oh, wow. And I did social media at UCLA. Then I did Google Analytics in Vancouver. I took a Google Analytics course. Um, I also st- studied for my Series 7. So I was studying for my Series 7. But I didn't want to do that because that was like a lot of numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did um, coding. Okay. So I did a coding class, a brief coding class. You know, um, and then, you know, it kind of led me to where I'm at now. My son's a developer. My, my little son, Jerron. Okay. He's, a, he's an actual game developer. So, you know, it, it was, um, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was either going to do digital marketing, which I'm doing now, but I was going to do that okay. full time. I was going to get my Series 7 and do investment full time, or I was going to be a rapper full time. <laughs> I was actually just going to do nothing else but rap and, you know, create music, create a hundred songs, pick the best 10, put it out, go perform. But I was weighing the pros and cons to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the pros and cons to, the cons to rapping was family time. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I wasn't gonna be around my family, so I just, I just scrapped that. Okay. And then, uh, and then um, the series seven was just like, 
I don't want to be around numbers all the time. Mm. I'm, I'm sure I could have done it, but just being in a desk the whole time, that I didn't like that. So then it led me to digital marketing, which is like now, that's what I'm doing with companies now, digital marketing and business analytics. Okay, for sure. Um, my last question I'm going to ask you is, Basically, like, what advice would you give to, you know, younger basketball players that are interested in going to the NFL? Like, what mistakes do you make going, like, up, like, pitch? Yeah, any, any young pro athletes trying to go NBA, NFL, MLB, boxing, anything. I would say uh, it's going to be fun. You know, enjoy it. Don't take it too seriously. You know? uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I say enjoy it, I'm not saying don't play hard. Right. You know, mm -hmm. if I say play hard, I'm not saying don't enjoy it. Right. Right. Enjoy the moment, like really enjoy the moment um, and bring your family up. Mm. If you can, uh, teaching them to fish, teach everyone to fish, everybody fish. Mm -hmm. Then when, you're, when you retire, you got a bunch of people around you that know how to fish, mm. you know, versus you have to, you know, recycle, the, the, the recycle and then bring people up again. You know, you right. want to do what I kind of like what LeBron James did. <laughs> yeah, if I could teach anybody, if I was telling you absolutely anything, <laughs> look at LeBron James. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. Okay. You know, you keep your family tight, bring up your people, you know. Um, yeah, just yeah, look at <laughs> LeBron James. Okay, for sure. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you for being on this podcast. It's episode one. So make sure you guys tap into our next episode. And thank you for being here. You know, I'll see you guys in the next episode. And I'm going to tap out.